means it's like I'm gonna cut it. But so I went all the way down as far as I could on 22. And then I got on a little bit, went to Portage, and got off right away. So I went through sure rural or wild rose. Wild rose. Yeah. So you were very very close. I think we even stopped because it goes through town, right? Correct. Yeah. So we stopped at a gas station to use the bathroom. Yeah. All right. So when you went on the chain of lakes, you probably saw some pretty fabulous houses. We did. Yeah. There's yeah. A lot of money. A lot of money on yeah. the chain of lakes. Yeah. And then we were looking at like how much because they were googling how much the prop the ones that had for sale. <laughs> Half a million or three oh, quarters of a million. Yeah, yeah. My dad right. got another two hundred. Hello. Hey Julie, how are you? Pretty good. That's good. All right, I gotta go to the ferry. How was your uh, Zoom meeting? I just stopped in for a little bit. How was my oh it was good. Very informative. I sent you an email or no, I shared something with you. Okay. I haven't had a chance to go through them. Okay. Hey, I have a question for you. Um, I can't find any students on seeds. <laughs> you can't? No. Okay. I will. Um, we're being taped right now, so I'll put that on my to-do list, and when we're done here, I'll go check it out. Okay. I don't know. I'm doing everything like I normally do. I just, my list doesn't pop up or anything, so. Um, when they roll over in July... Yeah. Um, I have to roll over your students. Yeah, I can see that they aren't rolled over because I was messing with some other things, but I can normally go in and find a student otherwise, like new sixth graders, because I yes. can't remember if I have certain students um, in my class or not. I'm trying to give some information to um, Meredith. I'll do that before I leave today. All right, appreciate it. And then you got the email from Carrie. Oh, yes. We answered that. And I added a conversation, a email conversation I had had with um, Jim. And as I had, uh, depending on what the county says, and depending on what DHS says, <laughs> about four times. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wonder now with the mandatory masks. I mean, I, I, I don't know if, I don't know that the questionnaire would have to be redone, but if people, if it would just be sent and people could respond and know that masks are mandatory, I, I have a feeling our numbers may go up a little bit in people that choose to stay home. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Hello, Lynn. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Linda. Hello. Can everybody yeah. meet themselves? Or and I, I, it's been kind of good news that the Big Eight has canceled ball games. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. My suggestion is going to be, and I haven't had a chance to read, um, Zach, I don't know what the first two football games are, but excuse me, when we moved, we remained an eight-man football. No, we excuse remained me. 11. Yeah, sorry, we remained 11. Most of Virgin Valley has become eight-man, I shouldn't say most, but about a third. So they are by, de by default starting two weeks later than we are. To me, it would make complete sense to just not do, they're supposed to, supposedly, and I, like I said, Zach emailed me and I haven't had a chance to look at it, um, two non-conference games, the first two. Well, let's just scoot the season back two weeks and not play those games, and that'll give us another two weeks to, to do stuff, plan, or whatever. Yeah, I would say for both of the non-conference. Right. I mean, the board hasn't, I mean, there, there really hasn't been approval to move forward. No. But I have it on the agenda for Monday again. And it'd be interesting with the ineligible players if they even have enough. So I hope they've been made aware of that. Yes, they have.
But it said on the news last night that WIA was meeting again this week. Yep, tomorrow. And I don't get their emails. Jim Favreau had heard something and he was talking about it at our fair meeting last night because that's another question. Do we have a fair or don't we have a fair? Um, and I said, well, you know, whatever, I think what he had heard is that, that all the ADs put in a proposal to do something. And I thought WIAA meet yesterday and they meet tomorrow, which whatever, they, I can't keep up to all the meetings. They just keep delaying it. Yeah. Um, but the, the whatever Jim had heard meant that football was canceled because one of his sons is a coach at River Valley in some way, shape, or form. And I'm like, well, that's news to me. I usually find out within a day. And if you said that was decided this morning, I would have heard by now. And see, they'd be division two, division three. Well, it's an all, it's all like it's a, W I A A is going to cancel okay. sports. They're going to cancel all of them. I mean, they're not going to just. Oh, right. So I said, well, I haven't really heard that. He's like, well, if we're not going to have football, da 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 da, with the with the fair. I'm like, okay, well, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> I got to get ready for school first, then I'll worry about you know the fair. So. All right, ladies, it's three o'clock. Um, I think I'm sharing my screen, am I? No. Okay, then I'm wrong. I'm not sharing my screen. All right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's only three o'clock. Of course I, I'm wrong. All right, so I linked the Harvard study. Um, Carrie is a real good researcher and she gives us stuff. This one was nice. It's, you know, I don't read all of them, but I kind of page through them. When there are 62 pages, I don't read the whole thing. But again, it's nice because it's got other things that one can look at to understand, even like what, you know, how was understanding COVID and stuff. So um, face coverings versus face masks. Um, I just wanted to make sure I, I had a bus driver meeting today. They might still be meeting right now. Um, but the one gentleman said, um, well, I had somebody ask me if we're even having school. And I said, well, of course we're having school. Um, but, you know, what, what we're doing to communicate is apparently not getting out there well enough. So we really have to do some more pushing. And I'll probably put some sort of a advertisement in the paper or on the radio that says, please, you know, check this out before you, you know, assume, please check in these areas. This is where the up-to-date information will be. Um, and I've been on the Sauk County list and they're using the terms face coverings versus face masks. Um, so there was a big discussion about somebody having a face, so required, the fact that they're required, we already know, but they should be approved because somebody made their own face mask out of like a mesh pair of shorts that had holes all over in it. And so I put right in the plan because it's a, it's still, you know, it's one of those, it's a changes we need to plan. It's not a set in stone plan um, that the face, I change it to face coverings versus face masks. And I put that they were required and needed to be approved because that'll give us enough um, oomph behind it so that I can say no that is not good enough for a face mask you must wear a different one if you have one or I will give you one to wear and that should be okay for all the teachers but I just wanted to make sure that we were covered no matter what does anybody have any questions on that Julie I had sent you an email I don't know if you saw it regarding um, what we would be handing out can you specify what kind they are? Well, we, we received um, several boxes of free face masks. So we will be handing those out um, when if it's to all students. Staff will get to pick and they can have either or both. We do have, um, I ordered some more face, face shields that had an undercovering to it. So there's clear, 
but they're still covered all the way around your face. So they come along, along your neck a little bit. So um, we have 35 of the, of the first kind that I ordered that has that neck covering. I'm sorry, that's how much it costs, $35. I ordered 15 of them. Um, and then I ordered 100 more. So we should be able to give every staff member two um, as needed. I was thinking two throughout the school year, maybe two a quarter or something. But if you want to wear, uh, there's also the plastic face shields that the county got for us. And they're very basic, just a shield, almost all that see-through stuff, um, even the band around your head. Um, and that does not have any extra covering around the neck. So I would imagine that if every teacher got two and you sat on both of yours and broke them, then you get the cheaper one and have to, you know, until we can order more. Almost might have to wear a mask with that one because the Correct. under is not covered or protected. So the idea is that we'll have them, but we're not gonna have, you know, one for every day of the week. The shields can be washed and worn numerous times. They're, they're made for that. Yeah. The masks, I, go ahead. I was just more concerned about the masks that we're handing out. Um, there are some that, I don't know if they can be bought in the store, but I know they can be ordered. They actually say on the box, not effective for COVID-19. <laughs> so I was just wondering where we're getting them from and if they say that they're effective or what? I, I don't know. We're taking the ones that the county got us, that they okay. gave out to all their ambulance drivers and stuff. And then we're also getting some from DPI. So um, I'm pretty sure we actually have over 4,000 masks in the building right now. Okay. So I don't, nothing is 100% nothing is safe against COVID-19. Right. I'll just say that right, right up. The, if you want to wear two masks, or you want to wear your face shield and a mask, your, your Rose Kahoot would say it's always better to be more protected than not. And if that's what you want to do, you're welcome to. Yeah, these are the paper ones. And I'm just guessing that some kids may come in with them too. So okay. we don't know if they're those kind or not. <laughs> well, and you know, if, if a parent's going to buy them a face mask and it's paper, we have the right to say, because it's now required and approved type of mask. So we would have, but we have some paper ones that are good for pediatric, but they're one-time users. Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, we just need to be aware. And we also have, you know, we have the mask to give the kids. And I do know that the PTSO wants to, his ordering masks with like a bulldog or something to, to do a little fundraiser, but they're not going to make money per se, but more of an in out so that the kids could have a special bulldog one if they wanted. Um, versus these just these are just plain white cotton masks. So, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. That's good to know, though. Um, we've been talking a lot with the high school, and um, we don't quite know what it's going to look like yet. So we we discussed having them in cohorts. So all the freshmen together, all the sophomores together, all the juniors together, all the seniors together. They all stay in a room, and. They could be in three different classes, all sitting in the same room if we all get them headphones and microphones. Um, not the best practice for education, because they might as well be sitting at home then, but they would be out of their homes. They would be able to socialize at lunch with their friends and, and during a different class, like Fayyad, they would have Fayyad to go outside and stuff. Um, and we'd have to buy the headphones and the microphones too but it would be very safe for them to do it that way. Um, we, we talked about uh, block scheduling. So maybe we need to have four two hour sessions in the day and nothing else for the high school. Um, and you know, they, there's four grades, you get two hours of math, two hours of science, two hours of social studies and two hours of English and that's it. And then maybe do we do that four days a week and only on Fridays, are the other classes or something. I, again, we don't know, um, but we do know we wanna limit their mobility and we wanna to get to essential learning. So um, while you all know I'm a very big music person, um, it's, it, yes, it's required for graduation in our district, but we need to make sure they get those four core subjects. And um, this might be a year that we relax our standards or something because we really need to make sure that they're safe 
and learning. So again, there's nothing out there that we're not looking at. Um, and I'm hoping that a group of high school teachers want to get together and discuss all of this. So far, um, there haven't been too many to, to chip in other than to, um, well, Mary Beth and Carrie have been chipping in or voicing their concerns all along. Um, and Jim does, but not in this meeting. So Julie, are you saying we may not even have like small groups to work with? Yeah, I don't know, Mary Beth. I didn't know you were there, thanks. Um, the we don't know that that's one suggestion okay to have block scheduling and then you know maybe the maybe the uh band would be able to take five kids out of a group and go practice or play and then after half an hour they bring them back and then then there's only that one small group walking from room to room um yeah, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I do think we need to have other options because I, I don't know if we're going to be able to have them pass between every single class. Mary Beth, how is the outside? I saw them set out up outside today. How, how is that going? Well, I, I'm getting a good tan. <laughs> 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 I know. I, I bought a... Uh, tent and the guys couldn't put it together they said it was too cheap so we took it back um no actually it's it's working quite well being outside i mean it gets a little warm but we have a little tree outside my room that i've really been using for shade so <laughs> I, I saw that's what i saw today <laughs> yeah yep so you know it's it's better than nothing yeah So we, and I keep saying that everything's on the table yet. Um, everything's on the table. If we have to, um, part of my concern is that, um, and it's really Kathleen's concern as of this moment, but if we're expecting the teachers to teach in a classroom and also have kids online or virtual, if they aren't taught how to prep for that to begin with, you know, if they're going to open their Huck Finn book and this is what we're going to do, well, you got to get that universal design for learning and be able to group projects and not have it be about reading the 10 pages. It's what did you get out of the 10 pages? And that's a complete shift in thought processes when you're prepping. So I, I don't know. Um, that's why I throw everything on here. So I don't want to not have all the classes, but I don't know how to limit the mobility and have them be available. I don't. The other thing I brought up to somebody else was maybe if we do fifth hour with, um, I think we brought this up in food service because we we're talking about that too. Um, fifth hour and lunch is considered one period and Mary Beth gets the freshmen one day and the sophomores are in choir. Jim's got his 10 kids in his class and the rest of the kids. So it's a junior's day to eat first. And we, they all have, cause it'll take us forever at six feet apart to walk through the line. Um, and then they go sit down. And then by the time the first group is done, then maybe Jim's class gets to leave five minutes before the end of their typical period. And then Mary Beth would release hers and Liz would release hers. And then there wouldn't be this mad rush to the lunchroom, but they would have hour and 15 minutes to eat versus not. And we'd have to have many people monitoring lunch. We'd have to work on props. That might be a pair of time. I don't know. It's a scheduling nightmare, but it is another way to accomplish getting the kids fed. All right, I will probably be sending out an email asking for um, groups that want to work on specifically high school. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like right now, but I don't want to take an option and discard it because I personally don't like it. It might work really well. I just haven't thought about it or I haven't thought it through. So. And there are schools out there, and I don't think we want to do that, that are having the face-to-face -face with fifth grade on down. Some are doing it with eighth grade on down, 
but high school is totally virtual. Yep. And I, 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 you know, what we have had feedback from parents, and that is that they would at least like two, two days a week or something where there can be some face to face. Right. But that's how some of the other districts are solving this with the high school of them going from room to room and place to place. They're, they're just not doing it. They're just doing virtual. Right. The other thing, um, I, I have been in contact with Jared um, Burke and Gary Sipstead and both Weston and Richland, while their plans are not fleshed out yet and completely 100% approved, they are both attempting to do exactly what we're doing. As many kids in the building as we can all day, every day. So it's more of a Sauk County thing. Part of that is because our numbers are low. A part of our reason our numbers are low is that we just had our first testing yesterday. So I don't know, I think it takes three to five days to get the results back. So tomorrow morning we have a Richland County meeting and um, we'll have more information about testing and the results and everything. I might have to wait for a following week, but um, I've also been invited to the Sauk County group um, because we do have students that live in Sauk County. So I just pulled up, Sauk County seems to have it a little bit more together um, and they have a COVID data hub. So um, they've got the definitions of what, I'm sorry, I probably skimmed way too fast, but you know, what is a negative case? What is a confirmed case? What is a recovering case? All the definitions are up here. So that's nice. And then they have, um, so right now they have um, 242 co confirmed cases and that's plus 13 from probably the day. Um, and they have 176 recovered, 17 were hospitalized, only three deaths. Um, and they still have four active cases, meaning that they were still on quarantine or whatever. Um, I don't remember all the details about it because the guy talked really, really fast in that meeting. Um, but he did say um, in Sauk County that July had more cases than all the other months combined. So they are obviously um, spreading it faster. I don't know if well, they're testing more and they are testing more. So yeah. they're, you know, that all adds into the discussion. Um, Richland County. And again, I heard this, um, the, for example, all cam, if they had a fever or something, they sent them to the hospital to get tested and the hospital said, go home and quarantine. They didn't test them. So we don't even know if our numbers are right. Probably they aren't, but, um, and we can't test for, I'm sorry, they can test for the antibodies to see if you had COVID, but right now we're only testing to see if you have a case that you have it right now. So that doesn't mean you, you, you know, I could go today and maybe I had it six, three months ago, but that wouldn't show up in my current test because it's just the nasal swab. So again, I don't know, but I thought it was nice to see a different county. So, Julie, go back to those numbers. Okay. So everybody understands the big numbers are their totals since COVID. Yep. The small in the green is what they change daily yep. on the bottom. So 13 confirmed cases probably as of yesterday. It's got a timeline. Yeah. Updated from Monday. It's updated Monday and Saturday or Monday through Saturday at yeah, four. Weekly. So, so at the end of this weekly. meeting, they'll update this and it might say 13 more today or 17. I don't know. But since All our right. second phase has started, we've had more, more with tourism started up as well. So that yes. adds to it, I think. I, I also believe. And Chris even said, Chris lives in the Dells and his daughter had like 10 friends over and they all went out and about. Now his daughter was in Spain when it hit. So, you know, she had already been exposed to it. I mean, otherwise, how could you not be exposed? It was Spain and it was, I guess, rampant in there. But um, he said, it's just, you, you walk around the Dells and there's nobody with a mask on. And I even today, I went to, I filled my car up with gas and I was wearing my mask 
and I went into Quick Trip, and they're all required to wear their masks. And I was, I was like, there was one elderly lady and myself. And I said, I, I, I said, wow, nobody's wearing a mask. And she goes, well, I wouldn't be if they weren't, wouldn't make me. So I was just like, okay. So everybody's okay with not wearing the mask, I guess. <laughs> so my son works at Wisconsin Riverside. He drives for the uh, canoes, canoe rentals. He's a shuttle driver. He wears a mask. Almost no one who gets on there wears one. Of course, they're not reinforced as employees either. I'm just, you know, crossing my fingers. Yeah. But it's, he said, a couple of people have started wearing them when they get on now. But okay. otherwise, no. All right. So does anybody have any other questions about Sauk County? All right, so I have started some food service questions. So I just put these down. Um, what, it, what are we going to feed the kids when they're not in the building? So if we do have students that are choosing to stay home, is that our responsibility to then feed them? I have no idea. Um, what does it look like to feed kids in the rooms? So we think we have a pretty good plan for that. Um, all the breakfast is grab and go. So the element, uh, middle school and high school now have a breakfast time that we can stretch a little bit if we have, if we dismiss one room at a time, again, in cohorts, I don't know what it would look like, but middle school is gonna be in individual rooms. So the, the kids in Laura's room could leave right away when the bell rings and go get their breakfast and then you know, knock on the door and then the next group can go get their breakfast and it's all gonna be grab and go breakfast. No choices, nothing. You get, you grab the bag, you grab your milk, you scan your card, you go back in and eat it. Um, and then um, elementary, we could very easily fill a card up with, with breakfast items. Um, you know, put the milk on ice and just go door to door Whatever kids want it, they come up, they scan their, their card, and they grab their breakfast and go. Um, and Annette feels that that is an acceptable way to do it for breakfast. For lunch, again, um, they were thinking about having two options, one being the grab and go. So that way the kids, if they don't want, I don't know, chicken nuggets and beans and corn, and we don't have to offer now, we can just put it so they're going to break their... We're looking in, into buying another warmer so that we can bring the food to a hallway and then serve and the, you know, a group would come out and get the food and then that group would go back and close their door and the next group would come out and we can serve them in the hallway, just them leaving the, their room to come out, get the food, scan their card and go back in um, versus walking all the way down to the cafeteria and trying to get food back without spilling, tripping, whatever. Um, and then, um, what else? Oh, we talked about having paper products for the first two weeks, just because we won't have any good timing. We won't know what it looks like. We've never served all the kids in a room before. So, um, just to give us a little bit of leeway and then, um, we're buying some more carts and some more, uh, perhaps another warmer. Um, we meet every Monday at three. If anybody wants to join that meeting, you are welcome. Just let me know. Um, I think that's about it. I'm feeling better about what that's going to look like because actually one of the ideas that I had, which was one menu item and a grab and go for lunch, just cuts down. You'll probably sell more of the hot lunch at that point, but if you don't like the hot lunch, then you get the grab and go, whatever that is. Um, it'll save time on, on serving and cooking and everything. Um, and Richland's probably going to use that option also because it just seems easier to not do it, that, to not have two big, huge meals. Anybody have any questions on food service? All right. If then scenarios. So some of the school districts that we've been reading about um, have it right in their policies or right in their planning that if they get one case in the building, one positive test in the building, then this happens. If they get two positive tests in the building, then this happens. 
If they get five positive tests, then the building shuts down, whatever. I don't know if that's even a good idea. Um, what do you guys think? Well, I think depend, I mean, we, we know that we have multitudes of pretty good sized families as far as that have been getting together and congregating. And so say one that one within that family would test positive. We know that all these others would be exposed. Mm -hmm. And um, so yes, we're small, but we're also, um, I mean, we have a lot of cousins in, in our school district. And um, so I think for us, it's gonna be difficult to, um, to manage if, if we get a couple cases. Because if they're gonna, if public health is gonna follow the, the quarantine rules, any of those kids that have, that have it and any of family members or whatever that have been exposed or that they've been together during the time, that time frame, they're gonna be quarantined as well. Mm. Unless they're gonna change how they're handling it, but that's, that's how they have been handling it. Anybody else? Oh, we have nine. Nine people are on. How many people are here? Lynn, Brooke, Sherry, Cami. Hi, guys. I should have looked at my who was here. <laughs> Welcome. I just started today. Um, so I, you know, I don't know how, how we would do that. And, um, that was one of Jim's questions. So for those of you who didn't see the email, um, he asked, so what happens if one student in one of his classes gets COVID? That means that he is, he needs to isolate. So he's like, so I'm out of Ithaca for two weeks. But he goes, what about my boys? I went home, I go home to my, my four boys or three, however many still live with them. And some of them go to school where now they expose the kids at River Valley. Are they all supposed to isolate? And of course, my answer is that's the health department's job. Yeah. Um, you know, give them the guidelines. Yeah, that's so I did. I gave everybody that I emailed. Um, I think I only did that for our staff. Um, so the parents that are non staff, let me know if you want a copy of it. Um, but you know, if you ice, if they were both about isolating, it's got a timeline, it's in color, and it's very comprehensive. So if you have no symptoms and you test positive, although I don't know why you would test, I guess if you would test um, because your family was exposed to it or whatever, or you knew you had somebody in the family with it, but you know, how long is the isolation period? What does it look like? Um, so it's it's difficult for a family because say uh, I would get COVID, I would go home and then my husband would also have to completely isolate. And I have it for two weeks and I'm symptom three for three days. But the last day before I go back to work, he gets COVID. So now I'm isolated for two more weeks because I've been re-exposed. So, um, and I, I would, unless you lived in a different room in the house and never saw each other, um, which, you know, depending on the day, that might not be so bad. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, you guys. That was funny. All right. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, that I, I, you know, I hate to put, but if the plan requires it and everybody thinks, yes, we really need to have a if, if this, then that kind of a thing. But I mean, Jim mentioned, so what if somebody in, you know, 
Penfield's room in kindergarten gets it. And that whole group is out. I said, if they never left their room and they're always down there, you weren't exposed. So that whole group unless might- Unless had a big brother. Unless they had a big brother that, you know, we would send that kid home, the big brother, because of that particular child. But again, you're always exposed to not necessarily just the people in the room next to you, but who they've also been exposed to. So, and I'm gonna keep saying this, I cannot guarantee that people aren't, are, are not, I cannot say you're never gonna catch COVID in this district. We can't guarantee it, period. Um, we're, doing, we're gonna mitigate the risk. We're gonna do the best we can with masking and social isolating and um, social distancing and cleaning. Frank and I had a very nice meeting today and he's writing up his cleaning protocol. He wants to try and clean the bathrooms every hour. And it's at least at the middle school and high school level, because um, those kids would potentially be leaving to go to the bathroom at any time. Um, excuse me, in the elementary, it would be, you know, the elementary always lines everybody up and goes to the bathroom. So then they could call Frank and say, hey, the kindergarten's all done with, you know, these two bathrooms, come on and, and clean them. So, um, and then the high traffic areas, you know, I've used myself for an example at 10 o'clock every day, I just walk around with a wipe and, and some stuff and I wipe off every single doorknob on the outside. It's a high traffic area, it's something that's touched a lot, doesn't disturb anybody, and now that's one, one more layer of the cleaning that we've had. Um, he did mention that, um, I mentioned that we might have to move somebody from nights to days and because he, may, he might need more help. If we're gonna clean the bathrooms every hour or even every other hour or after everybody uses them as a class, that's constant cleaning. Even if you just go in and spray and let it dry on its own, the high traffic areas, you know, the handles or the, uh, the door knob, well, the locks on the door, you know, all that stuff that you have, to, everything that's touched. Um, but then you have to let it sit and dry. Um, something else we brought up, if a child, if we're gonna be eating in the rooms, I would like the tables or the, where the kids are sitting to be wiped off because we, we don't want them to set their lunch on a dirty table and now they're eating with, you know, so they're gonna have to go wash their hands and somehow we're gonna get their desks and tables cleaned off. And maybe that's like, as soon as they leave to go, maybe they're gonna do recess first and then come back and the, the teacher can just do a spray or a wipe of something real quick on all the desks so that when the kids come back, that's, you know, the tray in their hands are the only things that's germed up by the time they get there. They'd wash their hands before they ate, you know, all of that kind of thought process we've been we've been talking through and thinking about and frank is um i made a meet with me today because i really wanted to do the richland center meeting yes tomorrow so um i made a meet a day early he wasn't quite ready for me so um but he is going to write it up for me so that i can say this is the plan all right any questions on that anything that i brought up i kind of wavered a little bit there back and forth Okay, so um, Kathleen has brought up several times prep time for virtual prep for teachers. How can we get coverage for the teachers to prep? So um, when you are a teacher and you have to have kids taught in front of you and you have kids at home learning from you also, you should prep differently so you don't have to have two completely different lessons. They should be the same lesson, but it should be um, have some universal uh, learning, universal design for learning in the mix. So um, that takes time. And as teachers, you know, giving you your normal prep time is not going to be enough if you're trying to learn how to do UDL as you're prepping your classes. So if you teach five subjects a day, you have to do 10 preps. If you're not thinking in the right manner. And that's a process that we know we have to work through. Um, I wouldn't be expecting anybody to come, you know, unless they worked all summer 
on their own time to just sit down day one and be able to teach to the same lesson, one virtual, one with kids in front of you. It just doesn't work that way. That takes time to learn that and to prep it and get used to it. And then of course you make mistakes and you have to fix your mistakes and modify things and learn from others how it worked for them. So there's lots of different things that are in there. And um, again, that's where I'm gonna say, so if, I'm gonna go back to that, if we do like the block scheduling, maybe that's two teachers, one's a, not, a core teacher and one's a non-core teacher. And you know, if it's a hour and a half English lesson, then that English teacher needs to teach for a while, but the other teachers, so I'll take Melissa, just throwing that out there because I talked to her last night, um, has to watch the kids and help the kids in the classroom so that the other teacher can, can connect with the online kids and there's not as many kids, but there's more teacher to kid um, numbers. Or the other thing that was suggested is, and this won't work either, I know, but you know, if, if a teacher wants to start working right now to get ready for the school year, do we pay them for their curriculum building time now? Um, I certainly wouldn't want to do it every weekend, but I mean, <laughs> I don't want a teacher to work six days a week. It's one day too many um, to get all the work done because they have to prep two different ways. The hope is that if we do have, um, oh, another thing I was going to bring up, sorry again, I think I'm rambling. If we have elementary and if we put, for example, all of the virtual kids in one classroom, then there would only be one contact teacher and one person that would, I don't know, be in charge of that. Um, that way the other teacher, maybe the other teacher has a few more kids or they teach another subject that would allow the other elementary teacher that extra time they need to, tech, to deal with the virtual kids. I don't know, that could be mutually agreed upon in, in, the, in the teachers, um, in the elementary, I don't know. All right, I talked a lot again. So anybody have any questions that are coming up? Are um, the, is it possible for the teachers to like, um, have a, a camera, a video camera in the room so that they are recording them so, or maybe the kid that's at home virtually is on Zoom with the teacher when they are with their regular classroom? Yes, is every teacher has a Chromebook that has a camera on it. Okay. So that is a possibility, yes. Okay, is that something that is going to have to be required of all the teachers that they're always, you know, if, if there's always a kid in their class, they're always going to have to tape their lesson or is that just something, something I haven't talked about yet or gone, gone that far? We've kind of talked about it at the admin level. <clears throat> Excuse me. We haven't talked too much about it with the individual teachers. Um, so some people don't have the best internet. Um, so they would not be able to live stream anything. Some kids are not in there and you know, they're going to grandma's house now. They're not at home anymore because mom and dad are working, but grandma can watch them and grandma doesn't have internet. Um, so yeah, they can drive here and download stuff, but then they'd have to do it all at night with their parents. So that's a concern. Um, right. But if they, you know, but if you were, you know, let's say you had two kids in your class were virtue and one could do zoom and one couldn't you can still like tape your class on Zoom and then still have it available for that student later on to download? Yes. Okay. That's a very huge possibility. Yeah. Um, we're, we were, we're kind of hoping that um, there, so we were talking about attendance and how do you make sure that a child that is online with you is really online with you and not just sitting there with the Zoom on and not watching? and not getting any work done. So we're trying to flesh out some, um, so for example, if a teacher has um, in, in Schoology, that's the name of it, right? Sorry, I blanked out for a second there. Um, 
and they have a discussion board, everybody that's online has to answer the, dis or, well, everybody in the whole class can answer the question on the discussion board and every five or 10 minutes, the teacher asks another question. Um, by answering the question, that proves that the child is online with you at the time. Um, that's another way to prove that the kid is attending school virtually. No other questions? Gosh. Probably some that don't want to be touched. Yeah. We did put out a survey to the teachers. Well, we put out two surveys. The first survey was supposed to ask the question and we got so muddled down in other things that we forgot to ask the question. So we, unfortunately, I feel bad when I have to do a survey to begin with because I'm sure the teachers hate surveys by now. Um, but the second survey had two questions. One is, due to the COVID crisis, are you planning on teaching here in the fall? I just needed to know. I did have one teacher say no. Um, I have not had a chance to follow up with that. And I had several, several teachers have very good comments. So that was the second one. So yes or no comments. That's the whole, that was the whole thing. Um, so I, I, I'm feeling pretty good that the teachers, while worried, are not um, so concerned that they're like ready to quit their jobs and retire or, you know, because that has been happening in many districts that teachers are just saying, nope, I'm done. See ya, I'm gonna not teach. So um, that makes me feel a little bit better because I was very concerned <laughs> that people weren't gonna come back. Well, does anybody have any questions? Or anything else that's coming up for you guys? Julie, this is Kara. I think um, that that if then scenario would be really helpful. Um, maybe constructed in some sort of flow chart or something that says, um, if there's this many cases in the county, then this will be the school um, procedure. Or if there's one case in school, then this is what the school will do. Or if there's two cases, then this is what the school will do. Likewise with athletics. Uh, and I realize that not all of those decisions are school-based. I know that we're taking direction from the health department and WIA and everything. So not all of those decisions may be made right now. I think when it's able to be decided, I think that'd be really helpful so that um, it may assist in planning purposes um, for parents, especially. They can say, okay, well, now the county is up to X amount of cases. We know this is the, the next. Um, probability with the school and likewise with the school um, cases if there's one or so many then we know this is what's going to happen next it might just help alleviate a little bit of those questions at least if there's some sort of guide of course understanding that it can change and the school doesn't know all those answers yet it might just be helpful for planning for families um, and then, like I said, with athletics too, um, you know, is there a time frame for when that decision will be made, or is there, uh, you know, like I said, it's going to be based on case cases in the area, in the school, that kind of thing. So I don't know if it's a possibility, but it seems like some sort of closure or if then scenario might be a helpful resource. I'll see if there's anything out there, Kara. I, I hesitate to make something of my own because I'm not a doctor. 
Um, and I, I, I keep saying that I would depend on, you know, our healthcare people to say, yes, this is a good time to close. I, I can see what's out there. I don't know if the CDC has something or, or if you want to look for something to guide me, I, I would appreciate it. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm all for it. I just don't know what it will look like. I can tell you guys a little bit more about the sports. Um, Yay. I had several meetings in, uh, with area superintendents and uh, athletic directors this week. Um, and our football team is supposed to start August 3rd. Cross country, volleyball, and eight-man football, which we don't have, are supposed to start August 17th. So one of the ideas being bandied about is to delay the start of football practice until August 17th, and then cancel the first two games, because I'm pretty sure, but don't quote me, that they're non-conference games. Um, and we, won't, we don't necessarily want to play people out of our conference, because what we're doing is getting more germs. Um, thank goodness we stayed with 11-man football because 8-man um, football, somebody said they had to go to, um, oh, Door County. What's the um, bay? Um, Sturgeon Bay for one of their football games. Like, that's three and a half hours to go to a Friday night football game. That's ridiculous. But because there's not so many 8-man football teams... So one of the things somebody suggested was for, for example, if we play Riverdale on Friday, we go to Riverdale and play Riverdale. And then the following week, we play Riverdale at Ithaca because we'll all have the same germs for two weeks. <laughs> so the kids will meet up with the same kids for two weeks. And we could do the same thing with volleyball. Um, I'm not too worried about cross country because of all the sports. That one's a good one. If they're aware of the beginning and the ending of the races, they can really do some good stuff with cross country. Um, they can very easily start kids at five minutes apart. If you have a group of 70, they're not going to be able to start all at one time. Um, the other thing is that um, with volleyball, for example, we can have uh, the girls stay on their own sides of the net and no visitors. And the other girls in the stands are all socially distanced, cheering their team on. Um, you don't need to have a huddle at the beginning to flip the coin. The coaches can do that very easily. Every time uh, the ball goes out, somebody throws in a brand new clean ball and you have like three different balls rotating. One's being washed at all times so that even though multiple people are touching it, it's being cleaned after every play. Um, you know, things like that we could very easily do to make volleyball safer. Um, football's the sticking point, of course. Um, I don't know how you make volley uh, football safer. Um, it's just almost impossible to be able to wear a mask or a shield or something under a football helmet. Um, so, that's really my only concern sport-wise. Yes, the girls could potentially get close to each other on the net when they're blocking and spiking and stuff. Um, but again, if we're going to play teams, there is some risk. Julie, I have a question. Um, I am wondering with sports, it, it, it's very confusing to me as a parent um, when I listen to all of the protocol, which I commend all of you for doing such a great job um, and putting all this together. But it's, it's very confusing for me as a parent when I listen to everything that's being put in place during the school day with the masks and the distancing and the cohorts. And then are students going to be told then after school, they all just go off to sports and play sports together? I I guess I just get really confused about do, does the protocol from the school day not carry over into the sporting events? And I, and I just am concerned that that's going to create a lot of confusion for the kids. I completely 100% agree with you. 
I don't I know. I think as a, as, a, as a child, though, they'll be so happy to be able to do something halfway normal, even if they have to social distance and not clap hands and not do that stuff. They'll have some sense of normalcy that I think it'll make them deal with the eight-hour school day easier knowing they get to go participate in something. And I don't disagree with that. My confusion is it, it sounds to me like there is no way that you would be able to institute the same protocol that, that is in place during the school day in sports. So, if, you know, for example, if we're keeping these kids in their own separate groups in these small groups, then if they're going to play sporting events, they are no longer in those groups. So then still they have that level of exposure to one another. And I'm not saying it. <laughs> that I'm, you know, it's right or wrong. I'm, I, it just confuses me as to why we're putting all this in place during the school day, but then for sports, it really kind of seems to go to the wayside. Well, because they're still going to wash the volleyballs. They're still going to social distance. They're not, you know, so they're still taking precautions when it comes to sports versus just being a free-for-all. I guess that's the way I see it. They're taking the precautions to make sure they can still participate but be safe um, and not have no spectators, and, and they are going the extra mile. So, Or even if kids maybe have to sign some sort of waiver. I mean, mine have been going to wrestling camp with Stetson Clary, and you just had to sign a waiver to not hold anybody responsible and go wrestle on the mat. Well, my, my concern, and for those of you that don't know who I am, I am Linda Peterson and I'm on the board. Um, I, I have to say I'm kind of disappointed. Uh, really, the academics and the education and keeping our staff safe and our children should be our top priority. And I'm very athletic. I played a lot of sports. I love sports. But I think there is a time that when we're, when we're saying our kids maybe can't sing or they can't be in band, that our actual classes in our school that we can't have, I don't know, all this mixing and mingling, Wisconsin is just wild right now. And we have, we have kids traveling all over. So even the start of our school is gonna be dangerous because They've been in hot spots, playing ball. And, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is, and I know everybody is afraid to address it. But some of this I, don't, I, I really don't understand why it even needs to go on. Because I don't know where the school is going to get all the money and like the one person said, you know, you're doing all this during the day to keep everybody as safe as possible, but then the bell rings and it's, you know, you go, you go wherever. It's been quite disappointing because um, I would think parents would really want academics to be number one. That's no, education is very important. I also know if they don't have the, the sport side of it, do they go get in trouble, they go hang out with friends and do naughty stuff when they're not participating in something that they like and, and want to be in, then they're out doing other stuff and they'll get even more depressed than what they already are, which is a big concern. Well, that's a concern, Sativa, but my biggest concern is these students who come in, they are asymptomatic, and then they're going to be passing along this virus to others, and particularly the teachers who are going to be more susceptible. So I think, you know, maybe that's something of what Linda might be perceiving as well. I don't want to put words into her mouth, but if we don't have the teachers, we're not going to have the education either. No, absolutely. Need both of you guys. You guys are all very important, and the teachers are very important. And, and I can't do what a teacher does because I can't teach them the way you guys do. So, no, I appreciate, I'm glad we're still.
know, going to school as of right now, they need you guys. They, they learn better from you teachers, and you guys know what to teach them that's going to benefit them throughout their whole life. Um, I just know as a parent, when they don't have their sports to do, then they do cause other trouble and chaos, and, and they just get built up frustration, and they don't know how to take it out. <laughs> I realize that, and we're, we're going to try and address that as much as we can through, you know, social emotional learning, going to try and deal with the mental health as much as we can. Um, students are family members suffering, teachers are suffering. We're dealing with a lot of anxiety as well. Um, but until we get this COVID under control, some of the things just have to be put on hold. They really do. Well, well let me also go ahead, Sativa. Oh, uh, this is Cami. Oh, I was sorry, just going to say, um, WIAA, I watched a, a Zoom meeting that they um, put out. It was a couple weeks ago. Maybe you saw it too, but it was on a study, you know, some doctors did on anxiety and depression in um, student athletes and how it's, uh, the anxiety and depression has just skyrocketed since this COVID-19 and how exercise has gone way down. And it, that, you know, that was interesting too. And I think that's gotta be part of the discussion too, is, you know, a lot of these kids are getting depressed and they have, have high anxiety because they can't do their activities and they can't do, you know, and, and, you know, this is banned and forensics and all of that included in, in on that too. The study was just done with athletes because they had done a study on athletes earlier. So they just needed to keep it to athletes, but, you know, not doing anything is going to cause problems too. Well, we could look at bringing intramurals back where it's right within your school. Yeah, there can be a or lot of like, things. Like Julie said, for football, if we play Riverdale one week and then you play Riverdale the very same next week so that you're not playing a different school and, you know, you're you're sticking with the same people for two weeks. And so, which is great. I'm glad everybody's got an idea because to take it away from the kids, I think a lot of them will just will be very depressed and and it won't be good for none of them. You know, and I think this, the summer sports that are happening right now is a good indication of, you know, maybe what it's going to be like. I can't, you know, really speak for anything or anybody, but, you know, baseball has been playing games. Youth has been playing games. And, you know, my, my sister down in Waukesha, they've, her, her daughter's played 40 softball games and her son's played 20 softball games. And, you know, so far it's, there hasn't been kids that have been getting COVID and they haven't. So, you know, we've been, it's, it's good that some sports are happening right now to kind of see are the precautions that they're, they're putting in place going to work or, you know, and we'll see what happens in a month, you know, what, what comes out of it. But so far, you know, I realize some of the cases are going up, but not, it's not within the kids that I'm seeing. And I'm all for the sports. I think um, we just need to look more at those that have the least amount of contact, bring in the least amount of people from other areas. Um, there's a lot of substitutes as well, I think, like the intramural. Something else that we have mentioned at superintendent meetings um, in our Ridge and Valley Conference, um, there's about 50 officials um, and um, at least 20 of them have said they're not coming back because they're older, they do it for a little extra cash on the side and they don't want to be exposed to it. So it might be a moot point for the whole discussion because WIAA might do something. We might not be able to even have games because we don't have enough officials. Or, um, I mean, I'm all for the practice. We can social distance and, and do many things practicing versus having to have all the games. 
it's just another way of looking at it. Yes, I think if you even give the kids that, just the practice aspect of it, even if they got two games all year and that was all they got, I think they would appreciate that, just the schedule, the routine of getting to go to practice, your coach telling you to get your homework done or you're not getting to go to practice. Um, I think they would be halfway, can, they'd still be upset, but I think they would be content with that if they even got to just practice to be honest. Well, all the, all the things are out, all, they're all good suggestions and they're all, you know, they're all on the table. Things that we can do to make kids safe is, you know, our number one is safe and then education. So um, I was even interviewed by a TV guy yesterday and I'm like, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> I am all about education. I want the kids to be educated. And if sports didn't exist, I'd be okay because it's an extracurricular. That's just my two cents, so. All right, well, again, if, unless somebody has anything else to say, it is four o'clock. Thank you very much for everybody coming. Um, and uh, as always, email me if you have any things that come up between and I try and reply all and make sure everybody's invited to all the discussions because um, I do not have all the ideas. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.